even though I'm the person giving this talk, I'm actually presenting results that have come from a team of people working on this project, which was uh, has been funded by NCARF and the National Water Commission. And um, our, um, our challenge was to look at how we could build the climate resilience of um, freshwater habitats and freshwater species throughout the Australian arid zone. And we've just produced some draft national guidelines. I've put my email address down the bottom there because if you email me, I'm quite happy to send you the draft guidelines. I'd really like any feedback. I've got to uh, uh, get feedback, and, uh, um, take up feedback, and then produce a final um, copy of the report by the end of March. And then sometime after the end of March, it will be available on the NCARF website. So um, I'll let you read that. Those are the, our, main, our main objective was to reduce risk and uh, we've produced a portfolio of, of uh, approaches. But what I want to talk to you about today, um, in particular, are, are refugia or refuges. Um, our focus has been on aquatic invertebrates of fish. We only had a year to do this work, so there's a limit to what you can do in one year. Um, but uh, we wanted to work on things that were truly aquatic, so um, aquatic invertebrates and fish were where we focused. Um, you can see there the shaded area is the Great Artesian Basin. I don't know how well the, the drainage divisions are coming up. Um, but basically the arid zone, the arid and semi-arid regions cover 70% of the Australian continent. So it really is a very large area. The points here that you can see, well, most of my work has been done on the very edge of the Lake Eyre Basin, which is in central Australia. Um, we were looking at some data sets on invertebrates. Uh, we had a very large data set made available to us by the Department of Environment and Conservation in uh, Western Australia. Back in 2005 and 2006, they did a very large survey of aquatic sites in the Pilbara. Now, the Pilbara is one of the most intensively mined areas in Australia, and of course they were being proactive about really trying to find out what was there um, before it grew. Uh, but in fact, in terms of invertebrate surveys, which were available to us with, to work with, you can see there aren't all that many. Um, so even though there's, um, there's been a lot of work presented, um, particularly on Cooper Creek, in some ways there's still a lot that we don't know about the biodiversity, the aquatic biodiversity of inland Australia. Um, the first thing we did when we wanted to look at uh, refugial habitats was, was to say, well, what kinds of aquatic habitats do we have in the arid zone? And luckily, um, a paper had just been published, of which um, Adam is uh, an author, <coughs> um, which looked at uh, four main types of water bodies in the eastern Lake Eyre Basin. And we built upon that work to, um, to come up with, I guess, a larger suite, all the different types of habitats that we believe occur within the arid zone. And one of the things that we were particularly interested in looking at was whether these are surface water-fed systems or groundwater-fed systems. And of course, some receive water from both. But the major distinction is, do they get their water from rainfall and runoff, or do they get their water from groundwater? Because to manage any aquatic system, you have to know where your water comes from. And I've just put up some examples there of the different types of systems. So then I started looking into, um, oh, and I, sorry, I'll just go, no, I'll leave it there. Um, I started looking into the definitions of refugia. Now, you might think that this is academic, and I can assure you it's not. It's quite important. So evolutionary refugia is the name that's been given to water bodies that have supported, in this case, aquatic species over very long time scales. So these are things that have been there for, um, in some form, millions or thousands of years. In contrast to that, and these are permanent water bodies. Now, you can't actually, by going out to a water body and sampling it, tell how long that water's been there for or how old that site is. The way that we can get at this information is by looking at the species that inhabit these sites and particularly knowing their evolutionary history. So how long is it since they, how closely related are they to other species? How long ago might they have separated? from other species. So evolutionary refugia contain species which have been isolated for a long time and are quite different to their nearest relatives. In contrast to that, we have ecological refuges. And these um, aren't necessarily permanent water bodies, although the most important refuges tend to be permanent water. These can be much more variable in time and space. And really, it's context dependent. So it depends on the particular plants or animals that you're looking at as to whether you call a place a refuge or not. 
and then it depends on whether you're looking at drought or floods as to whether it may be a refuge as well. So once you start to divide up your habitats into, the, into these two categories, it then tells you something about how you should manage these habitats. But uh, so first of all, looking at evolutionary refugia, and um, I went through a lot of studies, and I should say there's been some excellent work done in Australia. Jane Hughes at Griffith University with colleagues, um, Nick Murphy working at La Trobe University. So Jane has been working on Cooper Creek and um, other dryland river systems. Nick Murphy at La Trobe Uni has been working on mound springs. Uh, Winston Ponder at the Australian Museum on uh, Mound Springs, Michelle Guzik and a number of other people uh, have been working on subterranean fauna. And so based on, on the work that they have done, it became evident that subterranean aquifers in fact cont contain what we would call the oldest fauna. Mound springs also going back probably a million years. Relic streams and local springs that I was working on in central Australia, I was being conservative when I said I think that that fauna has persisted, elements of that fauna have persisted since the last glacial maximum estimated to be about 18,000 years ago. Some very recent work done by Arlene um, Butwell with um, Jane Hughes at Griffith says, in fact, it might be older than that. And then finally, again, Jane Hughes's work on some of the fish and uh, mussels and shrimps suggests that some river Rhine water holes also might be harboring quite a, um, an old fauna. So that's the, the main types of habitats that we now believe are evolutionary refugia. Um, we say that these contain relictual species, so species that are relics of past climates and short-range endemics, things that occur nowhere else and don't and, and have fairly confined distributions. And the classic sites um, uh, are mound springs, and I'm not sure how well this is coming out here, but um, uh, I know people like Nick Murphy have said that these mound springs are really islands in a desert sea. And things like uh, isopods, um, quite closely related to woodlice, slaters, and then uh, snails, which, oh sorry, snails, which is, nope, it's going to take me back, no, I've got to go that way, no, sorry, getting my, right, um, I just wanted to point out, and you probably can't see it, but there's some tiny little black dots there, and those are the snails that this paper was about. So. Probably not the most charismatic of species, not the most iconic of species, but still they provide us with a lot of information. Um, a bit further up the charisma scale, or at least it is for me, are uh, dragonflies. And um, I think particularly the red one, Diplocodes hematodes, is a classic, uh, to me, an iconic species of the Australian arid zone. It's red, like its landscape. Um, they appear to be quite strong dispersers, um, so there's just a metapopulation that's occupying the entire arid zone. We're working on the molecular genetics of those now. We're also quite interested in much weaker flies, and these are the mayflies. And in fact, some have turned up in pools in the Simpson Desert um, a year or two ago when it was much wetter. And that suggests to us now that they can fly a lot further than we thought they could. So just to sort of summarise for evolutionary refugia, the, the uh, biota, the um, endemics and the relictual species that occur in evolutionary refugia are extremely vulnerable to any change in local condition. They're really well adapted to the conditions that are there. And because these are sites that are fed by groundwater, and in the case of the Mount Springs, it's the Great Artesian Basin, those habitats are decoupled from the regional climate. They're not dependent on rainfall. So they are the sites that are most likely to persist into the future. A drying climate is not going to immediately affect them. The organisms, the species that occur there, the residual species, occur there in quite large population numbers. That's why I showed you that earlier slide with lots of isopods. Um, so they're, they're viable genetically because they're in those large populations. But the thing is they have got no means of moving around the landscape. So if a spring is uh, drawn down by groundwater pumping, if, if this, it dries out, that population will go extinct and it will be extinct forever because there's no means by which organisms can move in from somewhere else, unless of course we physically carry them. No one is going to carry isopods or snails that big to another site, um, I don't imagine. So in terms of adaptation planning, these sites need a high level of protection and the groundwater resource that supports them also needs a high level of protection. Let's move on to ecological refuges. And, that, and we've heard a lot about ecological refuges um, over the last two days. So as I've already said, these are the sites where species persist, persist if conditions are favourable. Um, boom and bust is, um, I guess, describes what's going on, 
is going on. There's gene flow over a range of scales. But the species that occur at these sites are vulnerable to changes in the regional climate. So a change in rainfall will affect these species and uh, they will be affected by warming as well. So in terms of how we plan with climate change for these sites, it's not physically maintaining water in the landscape that's important. It's making sure that we have the connectivity between these sites so that the things that are already well adapted to moving around the landscape can keep moving around the around the landscape. And this highlights the importance of floods. Um, I th yes, uh, I'll get back to floods again in a minute. So I just wanted to, to reiterate what I've been saying about decoupling from the regional climate. If a site is really well decoupled from the regional climate, I think we can pretty well say that site will persist. And so, of course, the most highly decoupled sites are subterranean aquifers. Now, they're underground systems. I don't any, have any photos, but I was really impressed when Colin put up that slide of Cameron Wheel Caves. They are subterranean aquifers. So they're thermally and hydrologically quite stable. In terms of things that are above ground, well, mound springs, um, some thermal stability because groundwater is usually pretty cool, but they're open to the atmosphere, so they will heat up. So warming will affect them. But hydrologically, they're quite well decoupled, especially those within the GAB because it's such a big aquifer. But Tom Hatton, back in 2001, I think, wrote a report that said all of Australia's groundwater is in a state of net discharge, that our groundwater is running down. It's not recharging, so we've got to be mindful of that whatever we do with groundwater. The relic streams, which are the sites that I've worked on in central Australia, um, are quite shaded. Um, the, the relic fauna that occurs there, they're south-facing streams, so um, they, they are cooler than out on the um, surrounding plain. And they've also got a degree of hydrological decoupling, so they're a bit removed from local, uh, local rainfall. But they are the, uh, these sites are getting groundwater coming out of the, the ranges, so they're local aquifers, and those aquifers tend to be smaller. Uh, the water isn't as old. And we tried to summarise this in a graph that may take too long to explain now, <laughs> except we wanted to put it all together and say, uh, you know, you further, you come along this axis, more decoupling from the regional climate, the x-axis, is where your evolutionary refugia are. However, any evolutionary refugium also has some things that will fly in. So they also act as ecological refuges. Over on the other side, we have all those things that are come and go, the temporary sites. And it really depends on the dispersal ability of the fauna, which is what I told you previously. Uh, getting back to floods, the importance of floods, beneficial flooding. Um, to, um, to ensure that um, ecological refuges are resilient systems, we need to make sure that the processes of dispersal colonisation and what happens when they get there um, are all supported. And ensuring that we have floods is one way of supporting most of those processes. The other thing is that we have to have good quality habitats to ensure that things that do turn up can then actually live there and reproduce. We also have a lot of temporary intermittent ephemeral water bodies throughout the arid zone. These are very dependent on local conditions, but thanks. Um, and in this case, it's not the water that is, the water is the refuge uh, for things like water birds that might be passing through. In this case, it's the sediments that are the refuge, because this is where the seed and egg banks are that hatch out when it does rain. So this is why we also need to protect the sediments of these sites. And that's something that often gets forgotten. If there's no water there, people don't think they're aquatic. I came up with a little framework just to, again, reiterate what I said. So if you're looking at your sites, you need to work out whether it's a perennial or permanent water body or it's temporary. Then you uh, need to work out whether it's an evolutionary refugium or it's an ecological refuge. And the thing that we might, that we need to be looking at in terms of adaptation opportunities is where new water is turning up in the landscape. Because in some cases, this may be the only place that will act as an ecological refuge. But there's no such thing as a free lunch. It was mentioned earlier, why don't we just pump some groundwater to save riverine water holes? Well, that groundwater may be supporting uh, an evolutionary refugium or it may be supporting a subterranean um, ecosystem. So we've got to be very careful about how we treat this new water in the landscape, but we shouldn't ignore it as potential habitat. 
how do we tackle climate change? Well, one of the things we need to do is to reduce the uncertainty. And the only way to reduce uncertainty is to have information. And so this is where I want to put a plug in for the fact that we need to be recording change. Now, if I said to you we need to be monitoring, everyone would go, yes, that's fine. Monitoring has such a bad press. I no longer want to use that word, but I do want to talk about the fact that we need to be tracking change. And the arid zone is a big place. Researchers like myself cannot hope to be out there doing everything. This has really got to be taken up by the people who are out in these places with water bodies that are particularly important to them. So lots of opportunity here for local communities, indigenous groups, landowners, um, and researchers like myself, and we need to instrument these sites. And you can instrument sites now for a fraction of the cost that they would have cost, say, five years ago or 10 years to put out weather stations. And this is what we're just about to do. Uh, we're just about to instrument, um, it'll either be Serpentine Gorge or one nearby in Central Australia. We're going to put out a weather station with depth loggers, wildlife cameras, bioacoustic sensors for things like frogs, because we want to be able to link changes in the regional climate, and BOM gives us excellent data on the regional climate, but we need to be collecting data on the microclimate. We need to be linking that to what's happening with the water, and then how the biota is responding. And a lot of that we can now do continuously, because things have got so much cheaper. I also want to mention, um, I can't go into all the other things that we've looked at, but through working in Central Australia, uh, a colleague, Dr. Jane Brimbox, who's been involved with the Feral Camel uh, Management Program, and Andy Bubbs, who's here, is involved with that as well. Jane, uh, once she started working on that, realised that the impacts of the feral camels were particularly high at water bodies and that these made um, good focal sites for looking at how things were changing once you removed the camels. So she's done a lot of work already and she's already started logging conditions and she's been working with ranger groups to do this work. So the precedence is already there. What we now need to do is, is to build this up. Um, so what I'm hoping, the vision that I've got at the moment, is that we do create this, uh, what I'm calling an arid zone waterhole change network, for the want of a better word, where uh, we do link in with people who might already be um, tracking various things at waterholes with just a little bit of extra help and some protocols could start putting in their own instruments. And um, Andy and I are both here and quite keen to talk to people about the fact that we would also like to, um, to uh, initiate what we at the moment calling an arid zone water security consortium. Because we think that the time is ripe, um, that, that we are now all very, um, I guess, cognizant of the problems facing arid zone water bodies. But unless we get together as a group and look at opportunities, funding is incredibly tight at the moment for anything on water in Australia. And we need to be very proactive. So we're having a workshop in Adelaide. You can email Andy or you can catch either of us to talk about it. And I'd just like to finish off by saying, I think it was Leone who said that we shouldn't just be looking at Cooper Creek. We should be looking at the entire Lake Air Basin. I guess my plea is that I think there's a lot to be gained by saying, let's look at the entire arid zone. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs>